there are many problems with the current meat production that we will soon encounter, actually. So if you think about a quarter um, pounder hamburger, which is a quarter pound of beef, then seven pounds of grain go into that. 50 gallons of water, fresh water, already alluded to, go into that. 70 square feet of land and uh, about 1,000 BTU of energy. That's a lot of resources that go into a simple, simple hamburger. That's all because we feed cows uh, and the cows then feed us. But the intermediate, the, the cow, is a very, very inefficient animal in terms of converting the vegetables that they eat in the vegetable proteins into animal edible proteins to such an extent that we currently are already using 70% of all our arable land to produce meat. And we could use that land for other purposes. In addition, it's increasingly known that our livestock industry is a big emitter of greenhouse gases, allegedly uh, the same as our transport industry. So those cows, and I, I, since I know these numbers, I look at cows in the pasture, and I, I think about these clouds of methane that come out of it. So there are pressing reasons to um, start thinking about an alternative way of producing meat, and that's not only because we go from 7 to 9 billion people or 10, but also because meat consumption is pretty much related to the gross domestic product of a country. And as the gross domestic product of some countries, in particular India and China, is going up, meat consumption will increase. So this is the human trophic level. It's where we are in the food chain. If it's one, it's a plant. If it's two, it's an animal that eats plants. If it's three, it's an animal that eats animals that eats plants. And we are at 2.3, meaning that 30% of all our proteins come from animals that eat plants. So we are at 2.3, and then uh, India and China went up for the last 30 years and are gradually creeping up to that 2.3. Indicating, and, and here is the, the correlation between the human trophic level and the gross domestic product, and you see there is a perfect correlation. Whenever countries become richer, middle class incomes rise in numbers, people will start to eat meat. The it's story a, of way, human sorry. evolution is one that is intimately tied to meat. Once we started cooking meat, then we could get lots of energy, and that energy enabled us to have big brains and become physically, anatomically human. Hunters and gatherers all over the world are very sad if, for a few days at a time, the hunters come back empty-handed. The camp becomes quiet, the dancing stops, and then somebody catches some meat, they bring the prey into the camp, or nowadays into somebody's back garden with a barbecue, everybody gets excited to come and share the meat. It is ritually cut and passed out to people. We are a species designed to love meat. Feeding the world is a complex problem. I think people don't yet realize what an impact meat consumption has on the planet. 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from meat production. We're also using something like 1,500 gallons of water to produce just one pound of meat. Meat takes up about 70% of our arable lands. There's no question that if we were able to shift more of our land into intensive fruit and vegetable production, we'd be able to feed a lot more people a lot healthier diet. With the global population growing from seven billion to nine billion people, by 2050, the demand for meat will double. We can't just continue doing what we've been doing. Unless we make some changes in how we produce meat on this planet, we're in for a terrible reckoning. Meat consumption was part of the human species. It's been fantastically beneficial for us. And now, by some horrendous irony, it's become part of a system that threatens our species. We have to do something about it. So these guys, uh, much more eloquently than I can, uh, uh, express the need to do something. And of course, we can all become vegetarians. It looks actually very appetizing. And some of you ex are experiencing that. And not only some of you, but two billion people on this planet are vegetarian, mostly involuntarily. And they live happy lives, they live uh, creative lives, procreative lives, so there's nothing wrong. We don't need animal proteins. That's just a myth that we need them. We don't need them. However, we like the product. We are, according to Richard Wrangham, a species designed to love meat. And that especially resonates with me. I know all the problems with meat eating, but I am a meat eater, and I will continue eating meat. So that's why it is also uh, particularly in my own interest to create a product that 
um, has the same quality and is actually exactly the same, but is derived in a different way. So what's the other option? Since about 2000, we know that all our muscle cells have stem cells in them. They are sitting there waiting to repair tissue in case of injury. What you can do is you can take them out, um, take a biopsy from a cow, get a small piece of muscle out of it, one centimeter long, uh, one uh, millimeter in diameter. That already has a, a couple of hundred of those stem cells. Very, very high in uh, density of stem cells. So if you uh, take that under the microscope and you separate the muscle cells from the fat cells, then you can also isolate these uh, stem cells. They can replicate, and they can replicate to the extent that from that one piece of muscle, we can produce 10,000 kilos of beef. So that means that you can basically reduce the total herd of cows in the world from half a billion to, let's say, 30,000. So the replicative capacity is tremendous, and since these are designated stem cells, muscle stem cells, they will start to produce muscle tissue when we provide the right condition. And uh, so first what they should do, they should merge, because a, a muscle cell is structure of a lot of other cells. So they should merge, and if we starve them, they start to merge. Then um, an interesting thing needs to occur, they need to start to perform labor. Because labor, as we all know, uh, exercise will increase the muscle mass, will increase protein mass, and protein is what we're interested in. Muscle is always attached to tendons, uh, it it's always uh, builds up tension, and that tension is actually the biggest trigger for these cells to produce the proteins that we are interested in. So what we do, we basically, we grow them in donuts around the central column, and then if you wait three weeks, they have started to build up that tension and they have moved into or differentiated into a full-fledged muscle cell that under the microscope is not distinguishable anymore from a muscle cell that you get from a steak from Walmart. So basically what we did is we grew 10,000 of those muscle fibers and produced a hamburger. We um, decided, this is a proof of concept, we decided to, in a sort of hybrid between a cooking show and a press conference, to um, show that to the world for two reasons. One, to sort of cut the discussion, hey guys, you know, this is not a myth, this is not a fantasy, this can be done. Um, and second, by the way, it also needs to be done because we have a crisis coming up in meat production and meat consumption. So this is a very small video of that presentation. We presented it appropriately in a Petri dish. It was cooked by a very courageous chef, remind you, this was a quarter million dollar hamburger. And it was eaten by two volunteers um, and, and tasted um, two people from the, the food critic and the food journalist community. And they said it was okay. For a quarter million dollar uh, hamburger, we expected a little bit more, but it was okay. And what's more importantly, they said, well, yes, it's definitely meat. Um, it has the consistency of meat. The taste is, is okay, it's a little bit bland. There was no fat in it yet, it was pure muscle. And I did fully agree, actually, with their assessment. So then you have a proof of concept, which is nice, but it's still you know, not a marketable proposition, a quarter million um, dollar. So what is required for this to make it into a product? One is we have to be able to produce it in an efficient way, in a resource efficient way, much more efficient than the cow is. Uh, second, it has to be internally sustainable. That means that all the stuff that we put in there has to be either reusable or in plenty quantity present. And third, it has to be exactly the same as meat, because it's not the animal protein we're looking for, it's the meat product that we are looking for. So how do we uh, go about that? For the, that hamburger, we cultured 30 billion cells. If you know anything about cell culture, you know that inherently it's not a very efficient process, it's not a very environmentally friendly process, you need a lot of plastic, but um, we already know that we can grow it in 25,000 liter vats, um, fermenters, on uh, microcarriers that are reusable, and that way we can scale up production. And that scaling up is actually essential to make it uh, efficient. So there was an initial life cycle analysis on what would this mean for uh, land and water and energy usage from the University of Oxford, and they basically estimated that obviously we can cut uh, tremendously on the, num on the amount of land, about 90% amount of water, not, a, not an important uh, 90%, and energy about 60, 70%, depending on where in the world you are doing this. So this um, is still preliminary, but it's a boost, obviously, for this uh, particular development. This is a busy slide, um, and it should actually be much busier than this. 
what we are doing in terms of sustainability, uh, one of the factors that is necessary or has been necessary in cell culture for about 130 years is that you use a blood-derived product to keep the cells alive and to keep them thriving, which is called uh, the serum, basically the blood without the cells. And this happens to come from cows. So um, when we reduce the number of cows as we propose, then we won't have enough serum to grow the cells. So you know, we have to get rid of the serum as well. Fortunately for a fair number of cells that has been already developed, not for muscle cells. And these are the just 30 or so conditions where we tested the proliferation of these cells under serum-containing and serum-free conditions. The red arrows are all serum-containing conditions, but the two blue ones um, are serum-free and they grow reasonably well on that serum-free, up to the point that they're almost the same as serum-containing. So that problem can be cracked and will eventually be cracked completely. In terms of uh, uh, mimicry, I'm just giving a couple of examples. These cells actually don't express a sufficient amount of a protein called myoglobin, which is the iron-carrying protein. And that's because we culture them under oxygen conditions that are ambient, and turn out to be too high for uh, muscle cells in cell culture. So uh, what we did, we reduced the oxygen concentration, and then the myoglobin concentration goes up fivefold. So it's a very simple intervention, and it's just an example to show that by changing the variables of this cell culture, you can actually arrive at a product that is essentially the same as uh, muscle tissue, and that is efficiently produced. Um, we're also culturing fat tissue right now. Remember those tasters said, well, yeah, it's, it's on the dry side. So now we are culturing fat tissue, and it actually can be done pretty easily. You use the stem cells coming from the fat tissue from the uh, biopsy that you take, and here is our samples of those fat tissues. These are spaghettis of uh, fat tissue that we have created through ways by uh, stimulating the stem cells with naturally occurring fatty acids so that they become fat cells. Then the fourth requirement is that it needs to be accepted. Is it fear for the unknown? Is it lack of control of over how food is being produced? Is it natural, unnatural? How do we work with these sort of uh, qualifications? It's, uh, it's interesting to me that there is a whole culture around meat eating that supposedly drives us to eat meat, and um, also, but also drives us at the same time to reject these type of alternatives. The news is not that bad. When we did a survey among Brits um, and uh, Dutch people whether they would want to eat this, about 52%, at least of the Dutch people and uh, 60 of the English people, the Brits, said, yes, we would actually would eat that. So it's not that bad. It's, a, it's an intellectual exercise that we didn't present the hamburgers in front of them and have them eat it. but at least they expressed interest in it, and they understand that's the, the nice thing about this product, although it may have sort of visions of uh, futuristic, um, very technical foods, there is a good rationale behind it, and people understand that very well. So another interesting thing is that this is supposed to be a, a hot dog, and people eat hot dogs. You know, do I need to say more? Most people don't know what's in it, most people don't want to know how it's being produced, and yet you eat it. So why is that? In my mind, it all has to do, well, it's cheap, and it's for people who like it, it's palatable, but it's also safe. You know, you have seen a lot of people eating hot dogs, and they live, they stay alive, which is a miracle in and by itself. That's an aspect of every new food, if it's produced in a new way, if it's safe or not. And that will just require time to get over that and see it being eaten by a, a lot of other people. The lack of control, you can do something about that. This is a technology that is simple enough so that you can do this in your kitchen. Instead of having, or in addition to having a vegetable garden, you can have a microwave type of equipment in your kitchen where you can produce your meat for your own family. You have to know about six, nine weeks in advance what you want to eat, so there is a downside to it. But it can be done, and it can be done at any other scale, at a scale where you can have control. This is Pookie. Pookie is a pig that lives in a neighborhood of a uh, small city. It has a couple of brothers and sisters in the same farm, not more. Um, it's fed by the kids of the community. 
it, the, the name Pookie is given by the kids of the community. Once in a while, you poke them, in, poke them in the butt, take stem cells, and in a barn adjacent to the farm, you grow the, the pork for that community. Then you have full control. You can visit the barn on Sundays with your kids and see sort of the produce of Pookie. And then you have full control over how your food is being produced. So yes, that can be done. Okay, so the other thing I think, and I alluded to it, is that food is always associated with culture and with emotion. And I think when we eat meat, there is this aspect, well, first of all, there is the aspect of nutritional value, the heme protein with the iron, uh, but there are also aspects of dominance over another species, the sort of the hunting instinct in us, the, the, the romance of fire and um, uh, preparation of food, and that is obviously not associated with a lab or a uh, laboratory person. So when this technology develops and we start to eat meat that comes from different sources, our whole concept of what meat is is inevitably going to change. It will no longer be a product coming from an animal that we have killed, that we have hunted down, that we have killed, that we have showed dominance over, and that we have, in sort of a romantic fire experience, um, cooked it. it. It becomes a very, very different product with advantages and disadvantages. So you can make this in all shapes and forms. You can be very creative about this. You can make it more palatable for kids, colorful in all sorts of forms, but you can also change, and that's more important to me, you can also change those fatty acids that are sitting in those fat cells to be more omega-3 rich. So you can create a healthier product so that at some point your physician prescribes uh, two weekly visits to McDonald's. Now, the fifth requirement, obviously, for this to become a marketable product is that the price has to come down from those quarter, that quarter million dollars. And we worked with one of the largest companies that produce stem cells for a medical application. And they have a model, um, a cell culture model, in which all the costs is, uh, are involved. And we entered our data into their model. It's basically how many cells you can get from that small tissue and um, how many cells you can culture per milliliter of that fluid. And so they run through the model with all the different phases of uh, cell culture. And then they arrived actually at a cost currently with the current technology, no improvements whatsoever, just scaling up of $65 per kilo, which is still very, very high. But it's already sort of in the realm of what the upper end meat industry is used to. Do you know? by any chance, what the, big, the, the most expensive hamburger is in the world right now? It's $450. It's not only the meat, it comes with uh, all sorts of other stuff, of course. But um, uh, this is not my ambition. It's not my ambition to make a product for a couple of wealthy people. Um, it's the ambition to make a bulk product to serve the world. So we are ways away from it. But with one giant step, we get close already. And I, I think that the technology can improve and we know where to do that to uh, uh, take this cost even further down. I have gotten used to the idea, and I hope you kind of got used to the idea, that at some point in time, maybe five to 10 years from now, we will have cultured meat as a choice in our food. And uh, although I haven't talked about animal welfare, because for me, the food security and the environmental issues are more important than animal welfare. That's a personal choice. But I think for consumers, the fact that we can create meat and, and keep on eating meat without having an imaginary vegan girlfriend looking over our shoulder and sort of tapping into our conscience will be a big consumer decisive issue. So the ethical issues are probably driving consumers to eventually choose for that. Because if, if you imagine that you walk, let's say, 10 years from now into Walmart and you have those two products that are essentially the same, they're essentially the same tissue. One says, may, may have a label very similar to smoking kills you, but now you know, an, an animal has been used for this product. And the other is animal free and there's no ecotex and that sort of thing. You know, then the choice becomes really hard or maybe really easy. 
that's my dream. That's what I wanted to share with you. Um, and I myself, I'm pretty confident that this is going to happen.